Hi, I'm Zor. Welcome to In Zor Education. Um, today we will continue talking about uh, conservation law uh, in uh, theory of relativities. That's a continuation, basically, of uh, the lectures which I was uh, um, talking about before. So basically, um, it, it's a course. You cannot really mm, consider this particular lecture just by itself. It's all the continuation. So. I strongly recommend you to go to the um, place where the whole course actually is represented, which is unizor.com, and this course is called Relativity for All. Now, um, on the same website you can find prerequisite courses, which are math for teens and physics for teens. Obviously, you cannot study theory of relativities if you don't know the basic classic physics and a uh, significant piece of mathematics, like calculus at least, and vector algebra. Now the uh, website unizor.com is totally free, there are no advertisement, you don't even have to sign in. Um, there are some functionalities, uh, advanced functionalities for teaching basically, where you might need to be like signed in, but that's it, there is a relationship between um, the student and, and the teacher. But for self-studying, you can just go straight to the course and uh, and study as much as you can. Now, every lecture on that um, website, including all the lectures about theory of relativity, um, is uh, supplemented with very detailed notes. It's basically like a textbook. So you consider you have a textbook, but for every like chapter, there is not only the written uh, piece, but also there is a lecture which basically explains the same thing. So I strongly encourage you to use the website <coughs> and read all the notes for each lecture, because in some cases I might actually be a little bit more detailed in the notes than during the lecture, I mean, just to save some time um, in a lecture. Okay, so today we will continue talking about conservation law, as I was saying, and um, the previous lecture was about kinetic energy, and this lecture would be about total energy um, which any um, object possesses, including the famous Einstein's formula E is equal to mc squared. Okay. <coughs> So let me start from the uh, results which we have obtained in the previous lecture. Obtained relatively simply, but looks complicated. So, if you have an object of um, so-called rest mass, M0, so that's the mass which we measure uh, in the reference frame associated with this particular object. So the reference frame where the object is at rest. So we measure its mass. Some, whatever we can, uh, for instance, using the gravitation uh, or, or some other way. So we measure the mass, it's m0. Now, let's assume that um, now the object is moving in that same um, uh, frame, so it's no longer at rest in the frame, it's moving with speed u. Then we have come up with a formula for kinetic energy of this particular object. It's equal to m0 c squared divided by square root 1 minus u squared c squared minus m0 c squared. Now this one is less than 1 generally speaking, because this is the speed of object, this is the speed of light, which means that the whole fraction is greater than m0 c squared. We divide by something which is less than zero, uh, less than one, sorry, which means it's increasing. So that's why this is the positive, or at least not negative, let's put it this way. Only if u is zero, we have this one, and we have result is zero, which is obvious, if speed is uh, zero, you have kinetic energy zero. That, that, that's okay. But formula looks quite complicated, quite frankly. Remember the formula in classical mechanics. 
one half mv squared. Remember this? Or mu squared in this particular case. Okay, so that's much more complex and, well, there is a justification for this. The justification was that the speed of light, c, is constant in every frame. In every inertial frame, the speed of light is the same, and to preserve this particular postulate, which we have accepted, because based on experiments, basically, we have come up that the formula must be a little bit more complex. We also um, talked about in the previous lecture that if u is really small, we basically change this relatively, you know, kind of weird ex uh, um, expression to Taylor um, uh, series. And if we will approximate with only a couple of members of Taylor series and do all the calculations, we will have the classical formula one half of m uh, u square. So it corresponds to the classical mechanics when u is really small, when the speed is uh, small. However, there is still some explanation obviously needed because formula looks weird. But let's just think about this. Now, K is kinetic energy. Well, which means this is supposed to be energy, right? Now, if we are using plus or minus between two different things in physics, they must be of the same type. Now, in mathematics, we can add, subtract any kind of numbers, like pi and one-half. Well, pi plus one-half is another number. But in energy, we cannot combine, let's say, um, meters and seconds and add them together. It doesn't work this way. In, in, in physics, we have to, if we are adding something, it should be comparable thing. So this is energy and this is energy. There is no other way. If this is energy, then this must be energy. Okay? question is what kind of energy. Let's just change the formula a little bit. m0 c squared divided by square root of minus c squared c squared is equal to mc squared plus k. <coughs> so this is energy which is independent on any kind of um, a reference frame you're measuring this energy because this is the uh, rest mass which means it's always within a particular uh, reference system which is related to this particular object the object is at rest so whenever we go to another reference system or this mo this th or this um, particular object starts moving whatever it is this is a constant now, this thing depends on the speed. And as speed is increasing, the u over c is closer and closer to 1. The whole thing is closer to 0, which means that the whole thing is increasing to basically to infinity. Because if u is closer and closer to c, the whole this thing, which is energy, again, we have agreed that it, these are all energies, so this energy is increasing to infinity. Well, because the k is infinity, uh, increasing to infinity, and this one stays constant. Now, what Einstein has basically proposed, and it was confirmed in many experiments, and it was theoretically justified in many different ways, he has assumed that this is an energy. We know it's supposed to be an energy, but what kind of energy? It just stays with the body as a constant, basically. So he assumed this is energy which is concentrated in the body just based on its mass, rest mass. So this is an amount of energy concentrated in the body just because it has a mass. Now, as the body starts moving with certain speed, we add kinetic energy to it as well. And that's why this can be considered as a total energy. So the total energy is combined 
um, from the uh, energy of the uh, object at rest and its kinetic energy. Now, there is another type of energy potential, but that's if we are in some kind of a um, field, like gravitational field, or I mean, that's supposed to be added as well to a total energy, but right now we're not talking about this. We're talking about vacuum. We're talking about only the body, the, uh, the, the, the object, and it's moving uh, in vacuum, just, just that. So, again, on the left side, we have a total energy which object possesses. And on the right side, we have basically split it into the inner energy the uh, object uh, has. This is a rest energy, concentrated in the mass which is at rest, which is constant, and kinetic energy based on movement. Now, if you have an object that, and, and if you are in some other inertial frame moving relative to this particular object which is at rest in its own rest reference frame, well, the speed of this object relative to the moving frame obviously is not zero, which means the object is uh, in possession of certain kinetic energy in the moving system. So, again, one system object is at rest, but then another system which is moving relative to the first one. And that's, well, since the object has certain speed relative to the moving frame, right? It's moving frame doing this, so they are mutually moving against each other. Which means it has certain speed, which means in that frame the total energy would be greater because the object would possess in that moving system certain speed and therefore kinetic energy. So, what's remain as a constant is inner uh, energy which is concentrated uh, in, uh, in the object. And kinetic energy depends on how it moves. Okay. Now, that's quite an interesting actual observation. It means that total energy depends on the system where you measure it, right? You measure it in a system where object is at rest and you have just this one. You measure a system, uh, you, me you measure the energy in some other system which is moving relative to this one and it has a speed component and that's why its kinetic energy is supposed to be added. So the total energy depends on the, m on the frame which you are w where you are basically measuring this energy. That's very important. Okay, so let's just leave it as this. And what I would like to do is, you remember the Lorentz factor, gamma? Now, using this, we will see that total energy is equal to this one, which is gamma m squared. Now, this is the formula for a total energy. Now, whenever you're talking about mc squared, you really either imply the rest energy, and that's basically something which people used to see in some textbooks. They used to see this formula. So, that's not exactly correct, because um, in this particular case, m is the combination of gamma factor and m uh, rest mass. But usually, uh, the more, I would say, more correct way is to represent it this way, then you know that uh, this particular coefficient is constant, which is depending on the speed and the rest mass. But people kind of used to see this one, but that's assuming that instead of this mass, you really mean this one. Sometimes gamma times m0 is called relativistic mass, but I think we're talking about that 
some people are against using gamma times m0 as relativistic mass. Well, it has certain negative um, implications. But some people still do this, and they call this formula correct, where m is relativistic mass, not rest mass, as in here. So basically, sometimes the gamma times rest mass is replaced with just m, implying relativistic mass. OK, so we have this. Now, now what happens is that if the body is at rest in some system, well, it possesses a certain amount of energy, which is m0 times c squared. It's at rest, no speed. Now, what if this body is, for whatever reasons, explodes? Now, it's no longer at rest. Its pieces are going all the way, right? So, what happens in this particular case with the total mass? So, you have to have certain mass, then it splits into little pieces and going into different directions. What if you will accumulate these pieces and measure the total mass? Well, this formula basically tells that the total mass should be less, because certain amount of initial mass is converted into uh, energy. Let's just calculate what happens in this particular case. So let's consider we have an object of mass m, and it splits into two pieces, m and m, which are going into, well, I probably should draw it differently. For simplicity, I would say it goes, let's say, up m and down m. Okay, so these are two equal pieces into which the object with mass capital M. This is the rest mass. So it sits and then all of a sudden it splits into two halves which are running in both ways with speed u and minus u, opposite speeds. So my question is, let's just calculate what happens with masses. Is there a difference, according to this formula, is, this, is there a difference between some of these masses to lowercase m's and compare with a capital M? Do we really have a loss of mass in this particular case, which is converted into energy? Well, let's just calculate very simply. Initially, the energy of the object at rest was m times c squared. Capital M is mass at rest. So the total energy was this one. Now, this energy must actually be preserved because we are assuming that the conservation of energy is a law, right? So it's supposed to be equal sign. Now, we have assumed that the masses of these objects, and we are talking, whenever we are talking about mass, Let's just agree that we're talking about rest mass, okay? So the rest mass of these two pieces is lowercase m, which means that they possess the uh, uh, energy 2mc squared, right? Plus kinetic energy. Now, what's kinetic energy of each one? Well, um, m c square divided by square root of 1 minus u square c square minus m c square. Right? That's the formula for kinetic energy. Again, lowercase m in this particular case is rest mass of these two pieces on which our object split. And this is the formula for kinetic energy. And two, because there are two pieces. And the same thing here. So these are energy at rest, this is kinetic energy. So energy at rest plus kinetic energy of two pieces must be equal to initial energy concentrated in our object. Okay. Well, what do we call equal 
two m c square will cancel out. So we have two m c square divided by square root one minus c square c square. Okay, now c square is also cancelling out, and we have the final formula. which is m equals 2m divided by square root 1 minus u squared c squared. Now this is obviously, it obviously means that sum of two pieces is um, less than um, initial mass of the object. You can just change it slightly, 2m divided by capital M is equal to square root of 1 minus u square c square, right? That's the same thing. Put m here and square root there. So this is less than 1. It's 1 only if u is equal to 0. So if there is no speed, if we just represent our object as two halves which are not moving, then we will have the, the sum of masses of these two pieces is exactly equal. But if they are moving, if u is greater than zero, you have this less than one, which means we are losing certain amount of mass to convert it into kinetic energy. Now, that was something which was the beginning of nuclear bomb. Because what what actually happens in a nuclear bomb, we have certain amount of energy released when the um, nucleus of uh, uranium-235 or plutonium-239 is split into uh, other elements. Much more complicated than in our case when we have just two equal pieces. There are many different pieces, but in any case they're all going into different um, direction, so they all have kinetic energy, and that kinetic energy is released just because our one particular nucleus is split into few parts. So this was the beginning of this Manhattan Project in the United States, and uh, the uh, development of uh, atomic bomb in all other countries. So that's very, very important thing. And what's also very important is that, well, obviously it depends on how much mass we are losing, but it looks like in certain cases we are losing significant amount of mass, and calculated multiplied by c square gives you a, a huge amount of energy. That's the source of energy which is really very, very big. <coughs> okay. Now, what remains to be done are two things. First of all, I would like to come up with very important um, equation between impulse or momentum of moment, momentum, and energy. Okay. Now, you remember that momentum, and again, that was in one of the previous lectures, momentum was U is speed, M0 is rest mass of an object, so its momentum is basically um, slightly more complex than classical momentum. Classical momentum is just mass times speed. In this case, it's not just mass, but mass at rest, because as we know, it's all different whenever something is moving uh, times speed, and then we have to gain this uh, Lorentz gamma factor. Okay, now as far as energy is concerned, we know what the energy actually is. The full energy is m0 c squared divided by square root, the same square root. Now, 
<coughs> believe me or not, and you can actually do it yourself, and in the notes I did it explicitly, you can actually have this particular expression. So if you will just do this, whatever I just did, you will see that it's equal to m0 c to the fourth. I don't want to do this algebra right now. It's really simply a couple of lines of code. But I know the result. And if you would like to see these couple of lines, they are represented in the notes for this lecture on unisor.com. So what does it mean? That's very, very important. Remember, we have spent a certain amount of time, and again, in my notes, I have a full proof that P, which is the momentum, um, is invariant if you go from one reference frame to another. Now, M0 is constant. That's for every object is basically constant. It's mass in the rest frame. C is constant, which means that you have E square equal to P square C square plus M0 C to the fourth. Now this is invariant if you go from one reference frame to another, inertial reference frame, which means E is invariant as well. So first of all, this is called the energy momentum equation. It's a very useful one. And uh, it basically proves that total energy, not just kinetic energy or potential energy, whatever it is. Now, we are talking about total energy, which is this one. It, it, it is invariant. Whenever you go from one reference frame to another inertial reference frame, the amount of total energy is always the same. That's very, very important. Okay, now. Um, what's interesting from this is what if m0 is equal to 0 for certain um, objects, I should say the word object is not maybe a good one, consider light. Light has speed but it doesn't have mass. There is no rest mass for photons. If you remember from our electromagnetism course there is a concept of a photon which is a elementary piece of light, if you wish. It's the beginning of the quantum mechanics already. But in any case, photons have no mass. No rest mass. Sorry. However, they do have speed. But in this particular equation, if this is zero, what do we have? We have E is equal to P times C. So energy of light and its momentum are related in this particular kind of relationship. Or if you wish, mo momentum of light is equal to energy divided by speed of light. And momentum is very important because when light bombards, let's say, some kind of a metal plate, it, hit, it, it hits electrons and they're kicked out. If you remember, this, this is um, the effect which was actually Einstein, who, who was one of the first who studied this particular thing, photoelectric effect, right? So that's what the impulse is coming from. By the way, the same formula can be obtained from classical electromagnetism and Maxwell's equations, etc., using something which is called pointing vector. There is a the pointing is a name. There is a guy. So what's interesting is that from this equation. We can guess, actually go all the way to this and prove this, um, just algebraically. So that's just another approach to this. And another confirmation that using this theory we have come up with a formula which has been known actually since the end of 19th century, before, before Einstein, before theory of relativity. This formula was known for light, for electromagnetic oscillations. And again, if you start with this one, then you can actually go all the way there. We don't do this, but if you want, there is something, some information on the internet how to approach it. 
So these are basically all the little things which I wanted to talk to you and the most important result of this lecture is this where gamma is Lorentz gamma factor. So that probably would be it. I do recommend you to read the notes for this lecture. Um, by the way, this kind of algebra I put in the notes, so it's, you know, it's, I think it's more satisfactory if you will see it with your own eyes rather than, than believing me that I, I just said you can do it very easily. And it, it is very easy, it's just a couple of, couple of lines. Okay, that's it for today. Thank you very much, and good luck. <laughs>